Hi everyone. This is the Chew the Cues conversation. I can't remember what number we're up to, but uh, welcome. And uh, today we have Jake Heron with us. Um, Jake, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? We're about to say, yeah, and uh, what do you do? Uh, yeah, good day everyone. I'm Jake Heron. I am in Roxburgh, Central Otago. Uh, sheep and beef farmer have been for for near on ten years now. Um, farmed here and abroad, and but definitely a bit of arable and deer as well over the years. Uh, yeah, currently lease 160 hectares in Fruitlands and um, contract to Natural Performance Limited as a regenerative coach as well. Uh, so yeah, my ambition really is to. Uh, help others find find their way into this um, this way of farming and, and to inspire as well. Awesome, thanks, Jake. Um, and yeah, just maybe I'll reiterate what to the cues is about. It is a conversation that we take questions and chew them over and never really reach any conclusion, but the um, there's really rich conversations around it and um, really spontaneous, um, really authentic discussions about important subjects. And so today, what we've decided to do is, Jono, myself and Jake have each thought of a question and we're all going to chew through the ideas in these rich questions and never come up with a answer as such. But uh, hopefully there's, there's a lot of a lot of goodness and a lot of nutrition that comes out of the conversation itself. We're going to enjoy chewing this. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this has been a long time coming. This conversation. I'm really excited about it. Um, and, and hearing what Jake's got to got to say and what his question is, and we don't know what each other's questions are. I'll start off. My question, or unless do you want to start off, Jake? Uh, we'll let you. We'll let you have the first crack there, Dan. Okay. Well, I'll I'll just offer my question up. It's um it's not really. It might not be clear, but um we can put some more information around it. In a nutshell, it's what is the difference between making a contribution and doing work. Mm -hmm. And um, I really liked in your introduction. Jake, how you said that your ambition is to help people and to inspire people. And to me, that, that seems like a, like a contribution rather than doing work. And um, yeah, so my question is kind of in line with that. What, is, what makes a contribution a contribution? And how different is that from doing work? To me, contribution just straight off the bat. Contribution is you're enriching, enriching the lives of others, um, and that can, you know, they the two can go hand in hand. Work can be a contribution. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think so as well. Like, um, I think it's all in probably. Because it, there's, like, I'm thinking of the time I spent uh, processing skins and pelts um, in Dunedin at Burnside, and uh, it was just a common conversation that everyone complained about their work. Um, but yet every day everyone showed up, and there were still moments of great camaraderie and, you know, teamwork as well as producing, you know, outcomes that benefit people in the form of, you know, salted skins and bull hides, et cetera. Um, so even that is a, is a contribution uh, and it's probably not a contribution to the person carrying out the work. Mm. Whereas those that are working not for necessarily the benefit of themselves, but for the benefit of others, others, the benefit of others, 
then they get the it's like their contribution to others it, it's a contribution to themselves at the same time like it's empowering it's uplifting it's energizing and that exudes out into what you're doing whereas if you're working and you've really got it that you're working and it's not a pleasant thing then do you guys know what i mean by you meet those people that uh you just get no we'll, do, we'll go to the, the other side of the spectrum first you meet someone at a say a service station gas station or something like that and they want to be there and it's like made you pleasant that your experience really pleasant and you think right i'm going to come back just because that one person and how they are and especially in a job that often wouldn't call for that kind of you know level of being or, or you know energy just like when you go to a place and you've if I found someone that's like, you know, really doesn't want to be there or perhaps, you know, really doesn't enjoy what they do and it's a real chore, um, it, it kind of, you pick up on that and it, it doesn't, yeah, you sort of end up thinking, oh, maybe I'm not going to come back to this place. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I've, I've been that person in the past and definitely, yeah, definitely didn't feel like I was making a contribution to anything other than my bank account maybe, but um yeah, it definitely felt like work, not a contribution. And on the flip side of that, now I uh, often wonder how I wonder how I came to be paid for what I do because uh, it really doesn't feel like work. <laughs> yeah, and you know, <clears throat> I can relate to that in that sense. But I'll add another layer to that when I first started coaching and really getting out there and with other people. And, and getting into their worlds and and really making a difference is um they were the like brokest years of my life you know like dirt broke financially but um you know my experience was that man I'm making a difference and that was the time in my life where I stopped needing to smoke cannabis to sleep at night like it literally bought me a more peaceful sleep you know, who's to say I wasn't richer then than ever, even though my bank account was, you know, often empty. Mm. Yeah, and we're kind of flipping between ideas of money being the contribution and, um, you know, helping, helping in the world as being a contribution. And the idea that money, like, I, I'm thinking a bit about stories, about stories that we're kind of brought up with and we're kind of uh, told and um, accepted as part of the world. And one story is that you do work, work is hard, you don't want to do it, but you have to do it in order to get paid so that you can do things that you do want to do. And that's that's a story and in a lot of ways it's a helpful story because yeah there are things like what you're talking about trying to um, working and, and doing skins and and stuff that there's a lot of aspects of that that doesn't seem like a something that you want to do but you get up and you do it <clears throat> but then you get you get to the point where um everything that is work must be hard in order to warrant being paid for it because or else why would you why would you be paid for it and the money side of it is it actually called compensation like your time is reimbursement is reimbursed because that's that's the story that's reinforcing that story that you don't want to do that. You, yeah. You're giving up your time unwillingly. And the only reason you're doing it is money. And so what I'm trying to really messily get to is that um, the contribution can go two ways. Like the contribution by doing the work, it is fulfilling in itself. Like it's, a, it's making a living 
when I do something that's really meaningful, it's making a living for myself and it's making a living or making a contribution for others. Mm. Like this, this conversation that we're having now, I feel like we're getting up early. Uh, we started at 7am um, on a winter's morning and Jake went out to the caravan and, um, you know, it's, it's not, it's, in some ways it seems like work but we're not getting paid for it as such. It, well, we're not actually, are we? Who's <laughs> <laughs> paying us? I was like, yeah, guys, come on. Yeah. <laughs> Am I missing out here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Come on, who's paying you guys? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry guys, I already sent my invoice away. Um. <laughs> oh. Right, I'm going in. Straight Let's in. Go. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, but it really feels I think, um, and Dan, I, I love what you said about the story. And you, you shined a light on a story that's been, for me, for years, like the truth. And that's uh, the story that I was um, brought up with along the lines of just work hard. Everything else will work out. Just work hard. Because mm -hmm. the harder you work, the more money you get in the story. Well, that's that's what we're <laughs> yeah, taught. Yes. Yeah. But but yet we're not talking we're not taught about work as a contribution, like like there's a a man who I forget I was listening to one day on YouTube, and um, he was talking about how if if your job showed up like an opportunity every day to make a difference, it would be a different job for you, you know, rather than if you just saw your job as something that you had to do, you know, it's not gonna, yeah, it's not gonna show up for you as something you're gonna want to do. You're not gonna spring out of bed in the morning without your alarm or without pushing sleep a million times when when it's a chore. But if it showed up, and it's all in, you know, all these things, including the stories we talk about are all in our occurring, you know, it's, it's all stuff that we generate and add meaning to. Um, and a lot of it is inherited <coughs> when you say stories, Dan, like they're so powerful because we're brought up around them and there's no one that we trust more than our parents as young little kids. And so generally what they say is, you know, is sort of law. And that was certainly the case until we reached this age of social media where people get to ask their own questions and get informed this way. But there, yeah, there was a time where whatever your parents said, that was the truth. And if they were running around saying, you've just got to work hard and, or maybe it's on the other end of the spectrum and you're listening to your parents say, oh, you don't work hard enough, which was something I also got brought up with. Um, not with, yeah, not with my father or mother, but um, just in, in around the neighborhood as a complaint, like you weren't enough if you didn't work hard enough. I think that story is such a huge thing for people uh, subconsciously. And I can probably speak to this from experience that when you don't recognize it uh, and you get the opportunity for your work to be a contribution in the sense that, yeah, you spring out of bed and it's not not work anymore. You've got the opportunity to earn, earn a living doing something you actually really enjoy. Uh, a lot of people self self-sabotage because yes, yeah, subconsciously we don't we don't know how to accept that mm. because we are you know we are, there is this uh, dialogue and culture of yeah of work being hard and not being enjoyable. It's kind of um, like the guilt if you're if you're enjoying it too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't don't smile at work. Get that frown on quick. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> they're not working hard enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know and, people that and, and, and working and working hard, working yourself to the bone, especially in the farming industry, is yeah. uh, well, and it, not just the farming industry, plenty of industries. Um, and New Zealand is as a general way, she is uh, is glorified, you know, it's, yeah, um, you know, and I still still catch myself doing it, but I can remember you know, working 16, 17 hour days or more when I was driving tractors, and um, and it was like a competition, mm. I had how many hours could I work? How, how hard could I work? You know, it, because it made me better if I worked harder. The big man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, how many hours do you work today? I work 25. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, I, and I've had a couple of those days too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, we, we do. We, we give those people honor. Like yeah. it's like a, it's like an instant respect thing. Like, wow, man. Maybe it's you like know, a confusion with contribution. So the more hours somebody works, <laughs> um, wow, they've made a huge contribution. Well, we, we're not brought up with that language, Dan. But no. we, we're where in our childhood have we heard the word contribution? Maybe in yeah. donations, like make a contribution to a good cause. Oh, I think there's even distinctions there between donation and contribution. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't donate as a sense of contribution. A lot of people will donate to make themselves feel good. Mm. Um jump in at any point guys and put your questions in i um i just wanted to just touch on what john said and about kids because yeah kids are a huge part of my life at the moment and um well there's so much i could say about how um how kids and parenting relates to contributions and work but um and how it's not seen as work <laughs> to bring up kids, which is so ridiculous, but um, but it's absolutely, I feel the most important contribution I can make is mm. to be a good father for my children, and um, and what you were saying about kids being um, believing what their parents tell them, and and then yeah, adopting the stories that their parents tell them as reality yeah my four-year-old eliza she hasn't got the story yet that um that you've got to do things but she tells us very very strongly when we try and make her do things and she has this way of um of putting her foot down really really strongly if there is something that we tell her to do and she doesn't want to she doesn't want to be told what to do so it can be going to get dressed in the morning if she decides to do it then um she's happy but if, as soon as we tell her to, to go and get dressed she'll put a foot down and say no <laughs> so it's kind of like it, she's at this age she's teaching us my wife and I, she's teaching us to um, to frame things that need to be done, um, to frame it in terms of something that you want to do, rather than, right, no, this is just, if you want to be a big girl, this is what big girls do, and you, you just have to do it. And, you know, rather than a discipline of, you must do this, and then you can play, um, she's so forceful and I mean, the, parenting is an amazing journey and it always changes, doesn't it, John? Oh, yes. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, to be, to be sort of told so strongly that it was such a strong resistance to any of that you must do is kind of enlightening for me because, yeah, it, it's kind of right the world shouldn't or the story doesn't need to be about what you have to do um, against your will. It can be framed up in a different way, which works with my daughter and just allowing her a little bit more freedom around how she does things because then she chooses to do the, the same, exactly the same thing, but she does it with a sense of this is what I'm. I want to do. Mm. It gives her choice, mm. like uh, even just changing the word "must" to "could," and like yeah. seeing seeing it as an opportunity to choose from, like an obvious opportunity. Mm. And that's that's not always the first thing that wants to roll off your tongue because we weren't born with that. We was well, certainly I wasn't taught with that sort of. You know, it was <laughs> it was it was. You know, 
do this or you'll get a hiding. <laughs> yeah. So you just, yeah. I mean, I got around just grumpy ass like all the time. Teachers, yeah, I don't know how they did it. And it's a tough one. I, I certainly believe in, uh, and I and I actually like the way you've uh, you've framed all that, Dan. I think that's really great because, um, yeah, frame those things we don't want to do as something, you know, as an opportunity or you know, or changing it to something we do want to. Because the reality is that life isn't easy, and we will all have to do we all have to do things we don't want to do at times, but we're not. Yeah, we're certainly not raised to reframe that, you know, within our own minds to, to make it easier to do or, or more enjoyable. It's um, a, just a, simply a case of, oh, I don't want to do this, but I have to. This is just this is just life. And yeah, if, um, if we could all... Well, and someday, sometimes you're just going to have to do shit you don't want to do. Simple, but yeah. If we, if we can find a bit more enjoyment in it, it'll make the days go a lot faster. Yeah. yeah. You might want to do it. Yeah, you might want to do it, exactly. <laughs> and it's kind of like an empowering way to frame it. Because, yeah, yeah. you reach that conclusion and the light is poor, so he is, he is reaching the conclusion that, um, <laughs> that she does want to do it it just is uncomfortable at the time so it kind of empowers her to to choose to do it but she knows that that's her choice she's doing something that she doesn't want to do but she's doing it by choice she's not doing it by this is something that i have to do sorry dan you've just gone really quiet on me there i can't quite oh, hear what you're saying is that better, is that better yep. now yep that's, that's been better. better yeah yeah so maybe we should move on. Have you got a got your question, Jake? Uh, okay, yeah. So I've got a few different questions, but we'll start with this one. Um, so we're all in the coaching consulting business, whatever. I was about to say, just make sure you keep it PG, Jake. Just uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't worry, John. Don't worry. <laughs> we got that stuff away, you know, out of the way. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, so we, yeah, we're all in the coaching consulting business. And um, so I guess this is a two prong question. I see in the, I've seen, especially I've seen a really good example of this recently too, actually, in the sort of more conventional consulting side of things, probably a lot of fear and pushback. So my question is, um, you know, do those guys, do those guys have a reason to be afraid? And uh, and then the other prong of my question is what what is the future of our game? Is um yeah, are we consultants, are we coaches, and and what is what is our future? Mm. Awesome question. Yeah, um, I've heard a few times from different consultants and coaches that they're aiming to make themselves redundant and I like I just cringe at that because yeah I see I see the angle of saying um I'll I'll offer you such good advice and such good empowerment that you won't need me anymore and therefore I'm redundant from from helping in this particular job um but, but that's not the overarching like what is coaching and and um, consultancy. Like the the future of it, perhaps, is ever changing. Like the future, it doesn't stay the same. You can't have the same recipe and apply it, um, you know, to each farm constantly every year the same recipe. Like, so I guess. In that sense, you're kind of constantly making yourself redundant and then reinventing your um, approach. <laughs> Things are moving. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've seen an example of that already with Integrity Soils. Um, Nicole, Nicole and her team have constantly reinvented the way they do things and now actually don't coach 
one on one at all. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's um that's where it's important and powerful for people like us to really turn on our listening and really listen for what's needed and wanted. And I think more than ever right now, what's needed and wanted is energy. That's something that hasn't been discussed much in the past. Uh, authenticity and integrity is other big things that I see as being foundations of what I would term future-based regenerative businesses. Um, the successful ones tend to have a foundation of integrity and authenticity. Um, and and I, I've never, ever done a business plan and I've never actually sat down and really, you know, tried to frame out the way that the coaching that I um, offer actually works because it is changing all the time. You know, if I say I'm building the plane as I'm flying it, it's it's not an understatement or a, you know, it's, it's the truth. <laughs> it's literally just keeping my listening on. Each person is so different at each time. You know, just like what you said, Dan, about as our farming systems changed and the management and coaching all changes as well. Well, you know, so does the so does the the farmer. And as as your perspective changes, more questions arise, more possibilities and opportunities arise. It's um it's never a case of oh yep yeah, that's uh that's ticked off the list that one you know. Coach. So that, in that in that respect, and this is something that's been coming up for me, you know we we need to be growing at the same pace as our as our clients if we want to stay relevant in the market because you know our our, our goal obviously going going in to see anybody is to is to grow, help them grow and um yeah so instead of just like you say Donna, you know the building the plane as we fly instead of having that framework which you definitely see in a more conventional sort of way is that you know we go in and this is how you do things and this is what we're going to do and then just keep selling that same thing year on year with maybe, you know, relabeled products or, or new products. Um, yeah. The challenge, the challenge to us is, is that we actually have to be growing just as fast, if not faster than our clients are to stay relevant to the marketplace. Yeah. That's, that's part of the integrity, Jake. Yeah. If, if it's, if, you know, if you're not setting the example for what you want, you know, with your clients, and there's not going to be, you know, you've got to, what's powerful is that people know that you're growing as much as they are. Is that sort of what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like you feel ripped off if you're getting coached by someone that you feel like isn't taking the coaching themselves. Yeah. When you talk about growing, I'm thinking, I'm wondering what, and what sense you're talking about growing financial growth or um, size of uh, business, number of clients, um, your offering is growing, like in terms of what products or what sort of angles that you approach the work or the contribution. Um, but um, I mean, you talk about energy, Donna, and then I thought about growth being um being utilization of energy and a and a real sort of and a real foundational or fundamental sense of how are, are you growing as a business? Are you utilizing energy and um and contributing energy? For me it's growing as a human being. Yeah. Nothing to do with status or financial wealth or belongings. I, For me, I it's think like... all, all of those things Dan brought up are relevant. I was definitely angling more in, in my comments towards the growth as a human being, but I mean, all of those things contribute to growth as a human being as well in their own way. Um, mm. So I think it's all relevant. 
True. True. Yeah. And the first part of your question, um, do was it do farmers have a reason to be? No, it's uh, um, I've just seen a really good example recently of a of consultant really just in the in the um conventional space really just uh slamming a farmer not not slamming him but shutting down here you know a farmer wanted to branch out and uh give bale grazing a crack and um and his agronomist just straight away was like nah it's the worst idea blah 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 and yeah this farmer like, okay whatever and when I went off the idea, so you know, I see that's I don't know if that's coming from a place of fear or or just yeah, I, I see a lot of this at the moment, and so I think there's a bit of fear out there around how relevant they're going to stay. And see, so, yeah, I guess my question was, do do they have do they have a reason to be afraid, or um, mm. or is there uh, yeah, I guess I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I think there's always a reason to be afraid. Like there's, there's endless reasons to be afraid if you start looking for reasons to be afraid. And um, in the agriculture sector at the moment, when you consider the protest that happened last Friday, um, there's lots of reasons that people have found to be really afraid. And and not just the agriculture sector, but um, the rest of of society, I guess, um, in terms when thinking about agriculture and land management, they found lots of reasons to be afraid about that process. So, um, I think being afraid itself is is one of the most unhelpful states of being that you can be in. Um, but. If you look for reasons to be afraid, you will be afraid. And so that's no, <laughs> there's probably no help in that, but um, that's my thing. Yeah. Your fear is a useful emotion. Um, it can let you know what's going on, but yeah, getting into a, a, a whole state of fear is not, not productive. <laughs> um, and I oh, guess, yeah, what I was saying is, I mean, change is scary. Yeah. <clears throat> change is scary so um but yeah it's embracing that and flowing with it um and yeah and there is a big there is a big shift going on out there yeah, yeah. We talked about um sorry John, i'll just quickly get this off my head um we talked about in our businesses how important it is to constantly change to constantly change to the point where it's not even a change it's just a fluid um growth and then the way that we operate is just constantly changing so much that it's that it's fluid um ideally and actually it has to be really when you're when you're working at the level that we're trying to work at um there's no point focusing too much on the past and, and trying to recreate the past um, but anyway, what I'm saying is you, when you're in that place of change is such a necessary thing, um, then the fear, the fear of change is really unhelpful because what it is is um, if you don't change, you, you do have every reason to be afraid because you're going to be irrelevant. And I'm not saying that about any particular issue at all. I'm just saying in, in general, like when you're, um, when you're afraid of change and change is necessary, that's a really unhelpful place to be. It also sort of links in with the feeling of not being needed or wanted, like on a, on a human being level, like your business all of a sudden is no longer needed or wanted. Yeah. It's, that could be easily made personal yeah. and i get that it's not but it's human that it's that's like part of the human default setting is we tend to make things personal it kind of is like it kind of is so close to being personal because um because that's what you do that's your occupation 
and when that's what you do with a huge chunk of your time, like maybe more than 80% of your waking mm. hours is, is your occupation, and suddenly you get this sense that perhaps that, that, that's becoming irrelevant, mm. then you know, then that's eighty percent of your awake time that is irrelevant. So that's pretty personal. Well, that's that's um, that's going back to the whole thing of fearing change and living in the past, because you're looking at the way you've done things as the way you can only do things. Yeah. And so when you're looking at eighty percent of your time being faced with redundancy, well, we can see that as like a you know detrimental blow or those that are constantly changing and adapting, you know, the, the ones that are dynamic. Oh, yeah, well, what am I going to do now to make sure that what I do is needed and wanted and just go and do that? Mm-hmm. You know, if we weren't scared of change, like it's part of it, what I believe is uh, that we've had it almost, you know, beaten into us, not physically, but everyone is getting around like being wrong is equal to like being stabbed in the heart Mm. as far as severity like you know everyone's so scared of getting it wrong or or just not knowing the answer or do you know what i mean guys like it's it's not embraced to not know when at every moment, yeah. like it's some of the most honest words that can come out of someone's mouth at times is, I don't know, but we've mm-hmm. made yeah. it that you cannot ever look like you don't know. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And, and when you're considering pain and when you're considering, oh, now my a chunk of my time is being freed up, I could view this as an opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that, that that is not knowing. That is it opens up space, and it's like, what am I going to do? What is my contribution that is relevant? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> do you, but do you get how that's generated at, at, at the level of self? Like, just so, so the 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 change in the conversation going from oh my God, 80% of my business is no longer needed or wanted to, oh my goodness, I've got 80% of my time is now available and free for me to do something. Yeah, but awesome. So, so that, that is amazingly freeing unless you start thinking about money. Right? Yeah. Even thinking about money, it's it's like, okay, well, before I'm not going to get made money if... if what I'm doing is not wanted or needed. So even doing nothing is still not going to give me money, but doing something. Oh, uh, no, there's apparently there's something you can go and get paid for doing nothing. Let's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, we won't get in there. Anymore. Let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah. No, I totally, um, yeah, it's all it's all how you perceive it, how you look at it, and yeah. uh, yes, certainly over the last twelve months, I've had a had some <laughs> spare time at times where I've gone, oh shit, what's um yeah the money, mm. and it can uh, put you in a very a disempowered place where you don't think of in, of opportunities and how to grow and how to become mm. relevant. Um, but yeah, if you can change that perspective to oh what what can I use this time for to upskill or uh, increase my knowledge base or network with the right people mm. to lead to an income where I am relevant and feel empowered and, and am empowering others. Mm. And that very quickly leads into, gee, I'd really like some spare time again. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to make some. Yeah, yeah, I've got to make some, yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, I, I better throw my question out because I we've got about fourteen minutes. Um. 
I better think of it. <laughs> you saying you don't know, Johnny? <laughs> yeah, I d- right now the question is not there. So no, let me let me just think what's in my mind. Okay. Okay. All right. So we've got this thing right now uh, where the up and coming agricultural season is going to be lacking staff and and manpower. And then we've got this other thing that uh, is the unemployed uh, people of New Zealand uh, not getting much opportunity to, you know, restart uh, themselves in the workforce uh, for various reasons, a lot of which is possibly just inherited uh, judgment. Um, so my question is, how can we turn that into an opportunity where we've got um, skilled and unskilled unemployed people uh, looking for work and farms that, and contractors that are lacking staff, how do we turn that into a win? It's a hard one, John. I definitely felt my own here as a dialogue uh, spark up there. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it strong? Yeah. Yeah, I definitely... Um, I, I, I definitely see there's, there's opportunity there. Um, I think I'd add a question to a question is how do we inspire possibly some of those not actually seeking work to, to you know... Want to get seek work. Work. Yeah, yeah. How to seek work or to want to seek work or, yeah, to... Um, to feel that, you know, thrill of contribution, yeah, and um, and fulfillment. I think what comes first is acceptance, um, because if you're in a position where you're not contributing, you're not feeling hugely valuable, and mm. then the whole world of uh, future employment, and even like the whole. Like I'll even go as extreme to say is like the general noise of the nation is that, you know, they, those people, the unemployed, like it's a, a you know, group of specific generic people uh, don't deserve or, or, or a, you know, what are, well, there's lots of terminologies, um, you know, dull bludges, all this stuff that just instantly labels the people who are currently unemployed uh and valuable uh, sorry not valuable and uh i know there was a time where i was between jobs after a car accident and i was living in a tent in my mum's backyard with no job on acc in omaru you know drugs were a normal day-to-day thing and man the future prospects were grim as far as, you know, what to do, who's going to give me a chance. And I was luckily, you know, someone gave me a chance and and I took it and ran with it. But if in the, in the, for me being on ACC, when I broke my femur, when I was 18, it was, it was like, a, yeah, I, I took it on that I was a dull bludger and I almost, the actions pulled for were the ones that fitted my description of a doll bludger. I'll go and start. <laughs> it's literally when I started smoking weed for the first time and started hanging around with different sort of people. And all of a sudden for a short time, the I was, you know, the stereotypical doll. Bl- or, you know, I was an ACC, but I still f- had it that I was a doll bludger. You started um, acting out. The I started. Yeah, seriously. I was in a tent in my mum's backyard. Crazy how strong that is, eh? That I had a pit bull. The story, so oh well, that's that's what I. I am. Yeah. (laughs) Isn't that powerful? You 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 hear the story, you tell the story. It's the truth. Yep, and that story is very powerful. Different situation, John. But yeah, well, I came home from overseas with an injury, and so didn't qualify for ACC. Um. And yeah, I was I was in the sleep out at my auntie and uncle's, and I was refusing to apply for the benefit because um, because I didn't want to be a part of that story. 
you know, and that's the very purpose that the benefit was created for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'll start before I take the benefit. That was me too, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I did take it in the end, but I felt hugely guilty yeah. about it. Um, yeah, but that, I mean, that's what it was created for. There were, and I did look for work opportunities. Maybe I didn't look hard enough. Who knows? But yeah, there were no work opportunities that I could see. And so it was my only option at the time. And that's what it was created for. But yeah, the story that's been built around it definitely uh, is off-putting. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not. It's not empowering. It doesn't oh. leave the person like, oh man, I'm going to really go out there and make a difference. I'm gonna yeah, build myself <laughs> into this community of whatever, whatever industry you're interested in. It's just not there when the story is, I don't make a difference. I don't matter. I love that question and um, it's an important one. It's because it's creating so much frustration for so many people on different sides um, about like not having the people to do the, the work and not having the work to do. Um, and I think um, to turn work into a contribution, sometimes I just add the word meaningful. So meaningful work can be a contribution, can be much more in line with a contribution than just terming it work and how much you get paid for that work. Because that, it's sort of, that's just in line with that story of, hey, you're a dull bludger, get a job. It's not, it's not easy, but if you don't, then you're lazy. And, you know, that whole story of um, work is hard, just freaking do it and work your way up. So work really, really hard and then you'll get to a more comfortable position. Um, I've certainly found in my experience that that is that part of the story is often not true. That if the harder you work, the better situation you get to. And um, and some might say that it's about working smarter, not harder. Um, but again, you can. It depends on where you put that the emphasis in the smartness of your work because. In a lot of ways, people's intelligence in terms of their careers is sometimes not uh, is, is quite competitive. So the the intelligence of it is how competitive are you at at, um, at winning against yeah and. Um, I don't know quite where I'm getting to, but um, but there's really very like... little heart and and thinking like that. Yeah. Like there's very little like you talk about working smarter, not harder. You sort of touched on meaning, and I'm reminded of Victor E. Frankel's book um, about his time in Auschwitz and how the ones that you know perished by disease or were picked up by the guards and gassed were the ones that stopped contributing. You know, the ones that, that literally, uh, like the book's called Man's Search for Meaning. And, mm. you know, if he said that if you, you know, got up in the morning and, and did your work and, you know, did what you were there to do, uh, then, you know, you were safe from the guards. And he noticed also like a difference in immunity and susceptibility to disease, which those areas were rife with disease is the guys that were doing something and making it meaningful, like a contribution, not the ones that were resisting, were the ones that survived. So I think as well, like, um, you know, not just about working harder or smarter to achieve different metric outcomes, like measurable outcomes. Maybe it's also about bringing meaning to what you do, like powerful meaning, and operating more with 
you know, from that centre, from that, I can't believe I just said that, like, but I mean it, like from that, you know, from your heart or from your gut, like you really believe in everything that you're doing. Yeah, I think <clears throat> we've talked a lot about, I really like that, you know, but um, we've talked a lot about hard work. I think, uh, yeah, the thing of, yes, yes, to be successful and however you measure success is entirely up to you, but to be successful, uh, we do have to work hard, but quite often that hard work is actually within ourselves, it might not be in the physical world. Mm. Um, yeah, that hard work is is changing our stories or, or yeah, or bringing meaning meaning to what we're doing or realising that we are enough, um, we are plenty, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, we are plenty. I think it's a great way to end it. Yeah, and, and also that word that you said, inspiring, is, um, is a great way to end it, um, Jake. And, and perhaps the closest thing to an answer to Jono's question that I can see is um, inspiring. Mm. How to bring that, how to bridge that gap, how to bring the people to the land to, um, to contribute. Mm. Closest thing to an answer, inspiring. Yeah, inspire people. Yeah. Brilliant. Bloody hard though. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that was hard. I feel so much better now that I've got a sweat on. <laughs> there was a time there where I felt like seriously guilty for like people ask, what are you up to today? And it was, it was a day off. I found that really hard to say like, oh, I'm not doing much today. Well, you know, just spending a day with the family. That was like, I could not say that. But yeah. I, I continue to learn that the, the hardest work that I've ever done is bringing up kids yeah and keeping strong relationships with yeah. with the yeah and anyway, you got the most meaningful as well <laughs> <laughs> yeah hopefully not too much hard work <laughs> thanks, all right boys man. thanks so much for your time this morning uh cheers guys it's been a pleasure okay have a great day you too we need to sign